In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord, we thank you for all those who are attending the Newman Lecture this evening. We invoke the Holy Spirit upon each one. May he enlighten and strengthen them. May he open their hearts to his inspirations through this evening's presentation. We invoke the presence of his Holy Spirit upon each one of us. May he enlighten and strengthen us. May he open our hearts to his inspirations through this evening's presentation. We also thank you, Lord, for the gift of Dr. Paul Witz, his wife, Timmy, and their whole family. We are grateful for all the good they have done and continue to do in the lives of each person they touch. Finally, we thank you, Lord, for the gift of Dr. Witz's life work, for the many people his books and teaching have helped, guided, and inspired through the course of the years, for the impact his work has had on the present direction of psychology and the future horizons that it opens. May you continue to bless our speaker, Dr. Kugelman, along with Dr. Witz, Timmy, their family, and all of us here participating in this conference at the end of this liturgical year and for years to come. Amen. Now I would like to turn it over to Dr. Rebecca Morse, who will give an introduction to our speaker. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are so honored to welcome Dr. Kugelman to Divine Mercy University again. Uh, Dr. Kugelman is currently at the University of Dallas, where he's been on faculty since 1977 in various positions and roles. And culminating in the esteemed role of Professor Emeritus. He's an active member in numerous professional organizations, including Chiron, the International Society for the History of the Behavioral and Social Sciences, which is where I first learned of Dr. Kugelman's work. He serves in several editorial and peer reviewer capacities for uh, many highly competitive journals, and also for well-established publishers such as Rutledge and Springer, and most notably for many of our faculty and students here at DMU. He is the recently established co-editor of Integratus, the Journal of Catholic Psychotherapy Association. He's written five books, including the upcoming 2023, The Soul and Soulless Psychology. And he has published 82 articles and reviews and innumerable presentations. And we are just absolutely delighted to have you with us, Dr. Kugelman, and we thank you all. Thank you. Hello to everyone who has zoomed into this talk from wherever you are. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it very much. I'm grateful to Dr. Craig Titus for the faculty and administration of Divine Mercy University for this opportunity. It is an honor and a privilege to address a few of the contributions that Dr. Paul Witz has made to psychology and its intersections with religion, philosophy, and theology. Thank you, Paul, for all you have done. I have heard you lecture many times over the past two decades, and I've read some of your publications. It has been an interesting journey in preparing this talk, hoping to contribute to the work you have been doing. At the beginning, let me tell you my conclusions that I, that I reached while I was working on this talk. I owe these insights to Paul. He has been engaged in the work of integration of psychology and Christian thought for decades, and these thoughts emerged as I read and considered what he has to say. My first conclusion. The psychology to which Paul has contributed leads back to the soul. The soul is the third thing between psychology and religion, uniting and dividing them. Paul is now writing about the soul, and the soul takes us beyond the self. Second conclusion, psychology has a religious unconscious, to borrow from the name of Paul's book, Sigmund Freud's Christian Unconscious. Psychology has never been unintegrated with religion. Following Graham Richards as well here, this proposition could be rephrased. Psychology is entangled with religion. You could express the relationship like this. Psychology is in some ways like religion. It is also true that psychology is not like religion. In other words, in going about the work of integration or disentanglement, we are not dealing with opposites, 
or with two fields that are mutually exclusive. We enter a play of identity and difference. This is too abstract, so when the time comes, I'll contextualize it. Third conclusion, there is a truth in self-worship. It is not simply an error, like saying two plus two equals five. The worship of self is a result of a misrecognition. The cult of self-worship arises from a confusion between myself and the imago dei, the image of God, at the center of myself. I, develop, I will develop these conclusions, but I wanted, to, wanted you all to be aware of where we are going. Next slide, please. What do we mean by psychology? Dr. Witz has contributed significantly to the integrating Catholic thought with contemporary psychology, starting with his book, Psychology as Religion, the Cult of Self-Worship. He has been walking on dangerous ground in his quest for a Christian psychology, since it is precisely those approaches in psychology that he saw as attempting to replace Christianity with psychology, nevertheless promised to open, nevertheless promised to open to Christian thought. Just to be clear, when I speak about psychology, I mean psychotherapy in theory and practice. That is, psychology as we are considering it here is that psychology that addresses the stresses, the sufferings, the pathologies, the torments, and the pains of living, loving, and working. It shares the ground with religion, in particular Christianity, which in its care for souls seeks to heal us in this veil of tears, this dark valley, this fallen world. Unfortunately, because both psychology and pastoral care tend to many of the same, many of the ways we suffer, some people conclude that they do not re need religion because psychology addresses our sufferings. Others conclude that they do not need psychology because religion will suffice. Paul in this book took aim at humanistic self theories that can be hostile to religion and can present psychology as the only way to find meaning in life now that religion no longer is relevant. He singled out Carl Jung, Eric Fromm, Carl Rogers, Abraham Maslow, and Rollo May as formulators of this cult of the self. Their self theories promoted a secular search for self-fulfillment and self-actualization. For many humanistic psychologists, there is little concern for explicitly religious meanings of the self that is fulfilled or actualized. This contends, moreover, that there's animosity towards religion among the humans. The pursuit of self-actualization reaches beyond psychology and flourishes in self-help and popular psychology. Paul points out that the boundaries between theory and popularization are vague with the humans. The topic of popularization of self-theory is a thorny one. The life world does not passively and whole hog assimilate scientific concepts. Social representation theory shows that they are selectively absorbed so that while the concepts may change everyday understandings of things like guilt and anxiety, the concepts themselves are changed by incorporation into a life world. For example, French Catholics in the post-World War II period took up psychoanalysis in a positive manner because it attempted to resolve conflicts among family members. French Catholics at the same time completely ignored libido theory. So, so was the humanistic psychologist. Everyday thinking took up self-fulfillment, but completely missed the boat on innocence, which is still a besetting defect in our national character, despite warnings about it from Rollo May and others. However, it is true that Carl Rogers reinforced our presumption of innocence in the face of evil. Witz's analysis of the various forms of self-worship or, cult or of cultural narcissism is an important contribution. What we find are legitima legitimations that cultivate modern certainties, such as self-esteem, self-fulfillment, and universal victimhood. Paul shows that these popular psychologies arise in a society devoted to the golden calf or the almighty dollar. Next slide, please. My aim in this lecture is to locate Witz's thought in the history of psychology. I will deal primarily with psychology as religion, cult of self-worship. Psychology as religion is a defense of Christian psychology, a polemic, as some reviewers claimed. 
This book presents a sophisticated self-psychology that dialectically relates to the humanistic self-psychologies identified at the beginning of the book. Locating Witz's work in the history of psychology of the self leads us to earlier self-psychologists, especially William James, Mary Witten Calkins, Harry Emerson Fosdick, Carl Jung, Gordon Allport, and Ronald May, and Paul Witz. Paul's critique of humanistic self-psychology serves the end of separating it from some of its philosophical and social presuppositions and reformulating it in Christian terms. Paul is in good company in this endeavor. Back in the 1890s, Edward Aloysius Pace, a priest and a psychologist, fresh with a PhD in psychology from Wilhelm Wundt in Leipzig, became a professor of philosophy at the newly founded Catholic University of America. There was at the time much furor in Catholic circles over this new experimental psychology. Two things were wrong with the new psychology, according to some Catholics. First, it was experimental. Psychologists studied topics such as reaction time, sensory threshold, and span of attention. Some Catholics objected. How can the soul be studied in a laboratory? The soul is our substantial form, not a sensory object. Second, and even worse, this new psychology was a psychology without a soul. Advocates of a soul, soul-less psychology held that psychological science must distance itself from metaphysics. The soul was a relic of pre-scientific metaphysical thinking on a par with alchemy, which was chemistry with spiritual entities and with astrology, which was astronomy with occult forces and powers. Pace countered both criticisms. A Thomistic thinker, he held that human beings were composed of soul and body. He was not a Cartesian thinker, so he did not identify the soul with consciousness, and he certainly did not think that the body could function without the soul. Pace saw nothing wrong with experimental psychology, since such research is grounded in sense perception and a result of investigation is always a particular, not a universal. Experimental psychology does not study the soul. It studies sensation, sense memory, problem solving, and the like. Observers, as the, observers, as the subjects of experimental psychology were often, call, often called, were rational beings with free will, and they voluntarily participated in these studies. Often, Graduate students and their professor would take turns in the different roles in experimentation as the observer and as the researcher. In early reports, the names of the observers would be given. The soul was present then, but it was not the object of study. Where psychology made a mess of things, according to Pace, was in interpreting their findings in terms of psychology without a soul. For Pace, Thomas better get involved in experimental psychology or the materialist would hold the field showing how experimentation supported their erroneous presuppositions. Witz in the 1970s faced a similar situation. If the self is left to the selfist, their work will poison the well of the way we understand who and what we are. These self-psychologists do, under, under, do not acknowledge the Christian claim that our relationship with the transcendent God orders our living. This wrote, quote, an overwhelming number of selfists assume there are no unvarying moral or interpersonal relationships, no permanent aspects to individual. The tendency is to give a green light to any self-defined goal that is undoubtedly one of the major appeals of selfism. In response, Witz has developed a Christian self-psychology. Psychology as religion like much of his work, belongs to a tradition of explicitly Christian and Catholic psychology. While there was much Christian psychology in the 20th century, it is also true that Christian psychology predates the rise of modern experimental psychology. It is customary to say that modern psychology begins around 1860 with the publication of Fechner's Elements of Psychophysics. It is worth noting that Fechner's psychophysics was itself entangled with religion. And in the 1880s, 
psychotherapy began with scientific recognition of hypnosis by Jean-Martin Charcot. Our popular psychology began in the 19th century with Samuel Smiles' book, Self-Help, published in 1859. When did Christian psychology begin? It depends on what you mean by psychology, but we can take the long view with Daniel Robinson. It began with Augustine's introspection and with his Trinitarian analysis of the soul, with Aquinas and other scholastics and their analysis of the soul in relationship with the body, with Descartes, the cogito, and the idea of the infinite, with various sciences of the soul from the 16th to the 18th century. In the contemporary era, with Desiree Mercier in Louvain, Thomas Werner Moore in Washington, Magda Arnold in Chicago, Rudolf Aulers in a number of places, not to mention others discussed by Misiak and Stout in their 1954 book, Catholics in Psychology. Contributions have continued since then, including Adrian von Kamm's The Art of Existential Counseling, 1966, and Charles A. Curran, Religious Values in Counseling and Psychotherapy, 18, 1969, and Peter Tyler, The Pursuit of the Soul, 2016. There is, in fact, a mighty stream of Catholic contributions to psychology over the century. And if this is not widely known, it's probably because a positivist approach has infected the history of psychology as, as it is taught. Moreover, non-Catholic Christian contributions to psychology over the past century and more abound. Witz's Christian self-psychology belongs to an important tradition in American psychology, one that I would call Jamesian after William James, who promoted scientific psychology, pragmatic philosophy, and pluralism pluralistic theology. This tradition does not hold to James's conclusions, but it does hold with the range of his considerations for understanding the self. Next slide, please. To grasp the significance of psychology as religion as a self-psychology, I propose to identify its formal cause. Formal causality asks about the essential quality of a thing, the soul of a thing, what makes the thing what it is. In an important sense, here we ask about the soul of the book. Formal causality is the tricky one of the four causes. To get to the essence of a piece of writing, Marshall McLuhan and Eric McLuhan argue, you must discover its readership. To whom is the writing addressed? Psychology as religion had a broad readership in mind, quote, the reader interested in a critique of contemporary psychology, Paul wrote, but it primarily addressed the Christian readership. The reader is invoked repeatedly, as when Witz wrote, quote, in addition to the development of an intellectual critique of secularism, the Christian political response is called for, unquote. This political response would be, quote, the quiet but persistent, immediate but long-term withdrawal of support from the anti-Christian activities of the modern state, <clears throat> whether these emerge from the left, the right, or the middle of the road, unquote. The book then addressed a Christian community. He extended a hand to non-Christians as well, centered on individuals who share his view that, quote, there is a worldwide fundamental conflict between Christianity and the modern state a conflict which has little to do with whether the state espouses a leftist or rightist political philosophy, unquote. If identifying the readership means to identify the formal cause of the book, then the essence of psychology as religion is a Christian critique of modern psychology as the servant of the modern state, committed to nothing but economic growth and development. Integration will have to continue to grapple with that essence. The book shows the diffusion of a selfless psychology throughout our society in lifestyles of self-indulgence that the presuppositions that endless economic growth is good encourages. Indeed, Witz warns us that we, the citizens of the wealthy nations, are heading for disaster and our psychology only fuels the fires of our undoing. 
Since selfism posits no value except self-indulgence, it offers no basis for opposing political and economic oppression. This wrote, quote, there is no reason intrinsic to self-theory self that it should be associated with liberal humanist values, end quote. Witz's argument highlights that what is at stake in the development of the science of human subjectivity. The intensity of the book arose in part from Witz's life, as he told his readers at the beginning of the book. Quote, by 1968 or so, I would no longer teach graduate or undergraduate courses that required me to cover the self theorists. Becoming a Christian provided me a dramatically different view of psychology, as well as a strong motivation for developing some of the critical analyses I had begun several years earlier. Later in the book, this confesses, in spite of my rejection of self theory, large parts of me remain which are still thoroughly indoctrinated with it. Particularly difficult are religious ideas like penitence, humility, accepting my dependence on God, praying for help. Here he pleaded with the reader, please, I would like to hear something that would improve my odds of obtaining salvation. Psychology as religion is a personal document. Such documents are not rare in the history of psychology. Indeed, Jung wrote that every psychology is in part a subjective confession of the author. In other words, any exploration of the psyche has a personal component. The self-explorations of Freud and Jung are examples of how psychological theory has roots in the life of the psychologist. So too is psychology as religion. It is rooted in Paul's conversion and his sense of where our world is going, the sense that we are living in a time of crisis. The waning of the modern age has begun, he wrote. Signs of the end of the modern age are, quote, the growing suspicion of science, technology, business, and government. That is, suspicion of objectification and the systems based upon it. Next slide, please. Psychologies of the self are relational because the self always implies another with whom I interact. The philosophical antecedents of self-psychology are in John Locke and David Hume. Hume found nothing in his search in his own soul. In American psychology, we can start with William James, who formulated an influential psychology of the self. James differentiated the material self, the social self, and the spiritual self. The material self includes one's own body, possessions, and family, indeed anything I can call my own. The spiritual self, the self of selves, consists of one's mental abilities taken objectively. The spiritual self is felt directly in acts of paying attention, for example. It is the social self, however, that is central for the history of self-psychology we are pursuing. For James, the social self is the recognition we get from others. He wrote this. A man has as many social selves as there are individuals who recognize him. From this, there results what practically is a division of the man into several selves. And this may be a discordant splitting as one as where one is afraid to let one's one set of, one of his acquaintances know him as he is elsewhere, or it may be a perfectly harmonious division of labor. These three selves are me, and different from them all is the I, the knower, subjectivity proper. This follows James in claiming that the, quote, objective validity of the self as rooted in the body has been ignored. Um, even as they have shown how the social develop, self develops in a cultural and historical context. James kept the body at the center of the stream of consciousness so that his self-psychology did not blow around in the cultural winds ungrounded. James' self-psychology had a religious dimension in our relationship with what he called the ideal or potential social self. And he wrote this, when for motives of honor and conscience, I brave the condemnation of my own family, club, and set. When as a Protestant, I turn Catholic, as a Catholic, a free thinker, 
I'm always inwardly strengthened in, the, in my course and steeled against the loss of my actual social self. The emotion that beckons me on is undoubtedly the pursuit of an ideal social self or of a self that is at least worthy of approving recognition by the highest possible judging companion. This self is the true, the intimate, the ultimate, the permanent me which I see. This judge is God, the absolute mind, the great companion. It is a fundamental characteristic of Jamian self-psychology and there's always a religious dimension to it. James' psychology with its philosophical, theological, and scientific fringes established a strong tradition in American, society, in American psychology to which Vitz's psychology belongs. Mary Whitten Calkins, an early American experimentalist and philosophical psychologist, was a student of William James. Phyllis Wentworth writes, quote, over the course of three decades, from the turn of the century to the late 1920s, Calkins articulated and defended um, a system of self-psychology that held that psychology as a field should be organized as a science of the self. For Calkins, a self-psychology was important because it retains moral and religious consciousness in psychology. Moreover, Calkins' self-psychology sprang from, in quote, interest not in the study of cells in isolation, but in the study of cells living in knowledge of their interconnectedness to other human beings, to a divine being or both. So that Calkins, like James, found that self-psychology necessitated a religious dimension in their social existence. Witz himself includes the work of Henry, excuse me, Harry Emerson Fosdick, a liberal Protestant theologian, in his history of self-psychology. Fosdick taught at the Union Theological Seminary, where his work contributed to a psychologized religious culture in the 1930s. Later, this seminary became a center for post-World War II emergence of the growth movement. Following Witz's lead, I include Fosdick in this genealogy of self-psychology because as Witz noted, these ideas about the self were popular in liberal Christian context before being widely published in the purely secular literature of psychology. The psychology of religion that Paul examined in his book then began with religion as psychology in the decades before humanistic psychology emerged. Fosdick was a modernist and his opponents were the fundamentalists. Fosdick, however, saw a significant flaw in modernism. And he wrote, this is what Fosdick wrote in 1926. Many a liberal preacher is so anxious to be rational that he forgets to be religious. For religion is not created, saved, or propagated by the rationality of its thought forms, much as that ought to help. Religion's central and unique property is power to release faith and courage for living, to produce spiritual vitality and fruitfulness. And by that, it ultimately stands or falls. To, capture, to recapture that religious property, courage for living, Fosdick looked to psychology and developed a self theory. For Fosdick, personality lay at the heart of the gospel. He wrote this. Jesus' attitude towards human personality can be briefly described as always seeing people in terms of their possibilities. He habitually looked at men in terms of what they might become. We often do that with children, but the marvel of the master was that he did it with the most unlikely people. He saw prodigals in far country, countries, women taken in adultery, and thought of them in terms of their moral possibilities. Unquote. Indeed, Bosnick claimed that Christ's, quote, estimate of human personality, its divine origin, its spiritual nature, its supreme value, its boundless possibilities, has been rightly called his most original contribution to human thought. Bosnick's 1943 book on being a real person developed this thought. And Witz observed that, quote, much of his theory of personality is difficult to distinguish from those of today's psychological self-theorists, especially Rogers. 
Hence the need for self-acceptance and self-love so that one can become a real self. Self-acceptance in the face of societal demands to be a certain type of self is a hallmark of humanistic self-psychology. Bosnick got to the core of psychologized religion in his stress on the wholeness of personality as a goal in life. And this is Fosnick again. In modern psychological parlance, the word integration has taken the place of the religious word salvation. No disorganized personality can be put into any situation so fortunate that by itself it will make him happy, while a well-organized personality and in confront with astonishingly satisfying results, conditions that at first seem insurmountable, unquote. Fosdick explained that, quote, process of, the process of organization, essential to personal wholeness, always involves two elements, discrimination and renunciation. Discrimination means that we must commit ourselves to values and aims that we deem supremely worthwhile pursuing. Renunciation means saying no to its contradiction. Both of these elements take positive faith to begin with. Bosnick developed his own formulation of the self-psychology, which contributed to the humanistic psychology movement of mid-century. Let me digress for a moment. This observation that ideas about the self developed in religion before being developed in psychology, as we see in Fosdick, is really important. It happened too earlier in the Emmanuel movement of the first decade of the 20th century, when two Episcopal priests, Elwood Worcester and Samuel McComb, combined hypnosis, suggestion, and education with pastoral care of souls and called it psychotherapy. Moreover, the historical roots of psychoanalysis are in confessional practices of the church. Recall also that some forms of psychoanalysis have been declared heretical by others, which them claim themselves to be orthodox. Psychologists around the turn of the 20th century borrowed spiritualist practices. A, a more recent example of this kind of borrowing from religion is in mindfulness. Uh, these occurrences point to a big issue. The integration of psychology and religious traditions is not the bringing together of two unrelated things. In its history, psychologies have religious elements. Purely secular psychology is not purely secular. Borrowing from Witz's later book, it may be that psychology has a Christian unconscious. The work of integration goes on all of the time because psychology and religion are related dialectically, not dichotomously. Witz's discussion of the New Age movement is another case in point. Following Jean Taylor, the New Age movement is an example of a shadow culture in American society, a mix of psychological, spiritual, and esoteric healing practices. It is a potent, if diffuse, integration or entanglement of psychology and religion. Carl Jung, whom this called, quote, the originator of much self therapy, self, excuse me, self psychology developed a psychology that is as religious as it is scientific. Mistakenly understood as a breakaway follower of Freud, Jung was closer to William James and Theodore, Theodore Flournoy, who stressed the creative activity of the unconscious. James studied the working of mediums. Flournoy and Jung also studied mediumship and the upsurge of mythic forms in dreams and symptoms. Jung developed the concept of the self with a capital S, but that self is not the self of popular self-psychology. In Jung's term, pop self-psychology indulges the ego, our conscious sense of ourselves, not the self, which is the archetype of psychic wholeness, the symbols of which include. There is a Gnostic element in Jung's work, but it is also true that there are Christian and indeed Catholic varieties of Jung's analytical psychology that are not egocentric or Gnostic, for example, Vera von der Heide. Gordon Allport made significant contributions to self-psychology. Witz noted that Fosdick cited Allport's work 
which supported Fosdick's emphasis on becoming and self-realization. Allport, in his 1955 book, Becoming, developed the theory of the self. Allport introduced the term proprium to denote, quote, all the regions of our life that we regard as particularly ours, that quote, make for inward unity. With the proprium comes appropriate striving, which, quote, distinguishes itself from other forms of motivation in that, however, in that, however, beset by conflicts, it makes for unification of personality. Appropriate striving includes the pursuit of long-range goals regarded as central to one's personal existence. And it always has a future reference. Crucial to appropriate striving is religion. Rejecting the psychoanalytic view that religion, that the religion of, of adults is a prolongation of infantile religion, Allport viewed mature religion as a, quote, comprehensive attitude whose function it is, is to relate the individual meaningful to the whole of being. Allport was also a scientific psychologist, and he noted that, quote, as a science, psychology can neither prove or disprove religion's claim to truth. It can, however, help explain why these claims are so many and so diverse. They represent the final means achieved by unique personalities in diverse lands and times, unquote. Moreover, religion can show us the goal of self, of the self's becoming. Quote, a person is a self-assertive, self-critical, and self-improving individual whose passion for integrity and for meaningful relation to the whole of being is his most distinctive capacity. Allport is known for his psychology of personality. And personality was important to Allport because it alluded to the soul, to religion, to the wholeness of life. Allport psychology is incomprehensible without an appreciation of his Christian faith. Finally, there was Rollo May, a Jamesian psychologist of the second half of the 20th century, a student of Fosdick and of Paul Tillich, the great Protestant theologian. May's chief contribution was the introduction of European existential psychology to North Americans. During his youth, when liberal Protestant had developed his psychological perspective, May got involved in counseling, which seemed a natural extension of his religious vocation. At that time, May, quote, emphasized the development of the individual personality along the lines of Fosdick. May even worked as a pastor in the 1930s. While later in his life, he would distance himself from Christianity, his emphasis on personality development continued. Self-actualization, understood in psychological terms, has roots in liberal Protestant thought and through it in American society. May's psychology owes a great de debt to this version of Christianity. May sounded a Jamesian note by emphasizing the will. By will, he did not mean willfulness or willpower, but decision and commitment as vital to the unfolding of the individual. For May, the work of psychotherapy centers, quote, upon the existing person and emphasizes the human being as he is emerging, becoming. Becoming is not, however, postmodern anti-essentialism. In fact, May warned that when, folk, when therapy focuses on adjustment, it adjusts us to a society that is dehumanizing so that we are, quote, happy at the price of loss of being. Significantly, in an essay, Psychology and the Daimonic, not Demonic, May wrote, I define daimonic as any natural function in the individual that has the power of taking over the whole person sex and eros, anger and rage, and the craving for power are examples. The daimonic can be either destructive or creative. Unquote. The daimonic needs direction, hence the importance of consciousness. May criticized Carl Rogers for his denial of the daimonic, making May a fellow traveler on the path that Paul Vicks walks. May concluded his essay on the daimonic with language that, while superficially secular, 
resonated with the Christian tradition. The passage illustrates the weaving together of the religious, and the psychological, and self psychology. May wrote, quote, the demonic in an individual pushes him towards the logos. That is to say, the more I come to terms with my demonic tendencies, the more I will find myself conceiving and living by a more universal structure of reality. This logos in, in this way is transpersonal. Bits like May came to stress the postmodern self, the transmodern self, excuse me, transmodern self as the way forward. Next slide, please. One characteristic of this Jamesian self psychology we have been tracing is its critique of modern society and psychology as dehumanizing. In Witz, this takes the form as defense of Christianity in the face of a secularizing society. But there is also his critique of economic self awareness. Even though some, like May, warned us about the dehumanizing characteristics of modern society, some brands of, of humanistic psychology succumb to human consumerism, writes Mitz. Quote, the consumer society combined with natural human pride has created a psychology that is focused on the glorification of his or her own self. Here we get to the heart. In one sense, we should glorify the self if it is properly understood. The human self is made in the image and likeness of God. That to see oneself as it is, is to see reflected the glory of the creator. Instead, we worship the golden cow of consumerism. And in what we could call with Lacan a meconnaissance, a misrecognition, we look in the mirror of consumer economy, consumerist economy and see ourselves flattered and pampered as little gods who can demand anything and anyone. Instead of beholding the amago dei within, we find the ego and confuse the two. Psychotherapy, after all, is a social institution, an economic one at that, and so tempted by, and so tempted by consumerism. C.B. McPherson called the kind of self that developed in the modern age the possessive individual, a person who owns his or herself and only establishes contractual relations with others. Possessive individualism runs amok in society, though having a population devoted to self-fulfillment is economic good news. It gives credence to Bernard Mandeville's 18th century maxim that private vice is public virtue. Unexamined biases are a danger of a set for a self psychology. Economic presuppositions may be the most important. My reference to Mandeville's book, The Fable of the Bees, was to indicate that selfish psychology has deep roots in convention in contemporary society. Let's observe that, quote, the material success of the contemporary economy underlies many of the assumptions which emerge in the selfish writing, unquote. He singled out Carl Rogers' belief that the economy will keep on growing, and as it does so, marriage and family and other pre-capitalist relationships will fall by the wayside. The possessive individual owes nothing to society, and traditional social arrangements can be negotiated and revised based on the belief that relationships are contracts. This quoted from Carl Rogers' book, Becoming Partners, Marriage and its alternatives. Quote, this is from Rogers. Marriage and the nuclear family constitute a failing institution. We need laboratories, experiments, attempts to avoid repeating past failures. This suggests that we consider, quote, the intelligent and increasingly influential economic argument for a return to a simpler and less industrial society made by the Christian economist E.F. Schumacher. This proposal was made by contrast with the selfist. Their psychology is dependent on, quote, the last stages of late in industrial urban economy, which is now, which has already begun to collapse. That's right. Moreover, selfism's, quote, advocacy of experience now and not inhibiting or repression 
was a boon to the advertising industry, unquote. Instead of liberating us from repressive social norms and roles, selfism enslaves us from de-repression and instant gratification. All that liberation takes money, or better yet, credit. Next slide, please. Let's discuss the postmodern views of Kenneth Bergen and Philip Cushman, who have described the emptiness of the modern self. Both Bergen and Cushman draw upon James's social self. Given that the focus is on the social self, Bergen correctly diagnosed our condition as the saturated self, because the number of groups to which we belong and from whom we get recognition have proliferated with technological changes. For example, before the telephone, a person could not have had the experience of being with someone else in an immediate sense who was not an embodied presence. Social relationships had been always with somebody. With the telephone, I am only with a voice. Moreover, from 1876, the phone appeared, to the present, the social media, emails, text messages, Zoom calls, and the like. How many social selves do I have now? Vitz following Gergen writes that we quote, we have a self without a center, created by a huge variety of interactions with different groups and environments. We experience a fluid and unfixed identity. The modern self, autonomous, rational, aloof from the flesh, has collapsed, says Cushman. There is no meaning to it all. This proposes as a solution to postmodern, a transmodern self, which he developed after 1977. In the psychology of religion, it described the dialectical development in three stages of the transcendent self. In stage one, the self, early human development, is undifferentiated from the object, the mother, until the other is differentiated from the self. In stage two, the growing self comes to see more and more of the world as its object, the self becoming Faustian in that the object, objectification of the world gives the self a kind of power over the world. The power exemplifies, exemplified in natural scientific knowing. Eventually, even the modern, even the self becomes an object for itself. And here we have the beginning of the breakdown of this modern self. Stage three is a reversal. Well, the only way out is to lose this self, to let it go, and once more willingly become an object again, an object in the love and service of God, unquote. This is the transcendent self, or the transmodern self, a self beyond itself. This transcendent self is not autonomous, not self-actualized, not self-determined, not independent. It is definitely not okay. The transcendent self recognizes that it is known more than it is knowing, more loved than loving. To desire to be an object seems a paradoxical one for a self that is understood to have the world as its object. However, this call to be an object derives from the psychology of St. Augustine, who differentiated the light by which we see from the light by which we are seen. For Witz, transcendence of the self happens, quote, the preparation of mind and will, transcendent awareness of God's love and will, is and, and will and is possible by God's grace. Indeed, in closing the book, Witz observed that, quote, the search for the transcendence of the self is now firmly begun. Next slide, please. While the self may have had problematic relations with transcendence, the soul seeks the transcendence. Transcendent. When the term soul was dropped from psychology, what terms replaced it? For many, it was the self. So it makes sense that to keep transcendence in mind, psychology needs a return to the soul. In recent years, that's what Paul has been doing. His path to the concept of the self has led to that of the soul. Back in 1998, 
in a review of a book called Reclaiming the Soul by Jeffrey Boyd, this suggested some topics to consider if we mean to bring soul back into psychology. Pay attention to the moral life. Remember our capacity for self-transcendence through loving others, and through reflection on one's own life, as well as cultivating the interior life. Ritz, this wrote recently, quote, the meta model has reintroduced the soul into psychology and along with it, the transcendent spiritual realm, unquote. In contributions to a Catholic Christian meta model of the person and elsewhere, Ritz has been cultivating soul making in psychology. His focus has been on the soul as formal cause of human life, on the distinctively human aspects are of our aliveness. The term soul means, quote, the animating spiritual form of the human body, unquote. The soul, which he compares to a code, such as the DNA code, quote, animates and structures the material aspects of the body and integrates those bodily processes with human consciousness and our spiritual cap capacities with human consciousness. He, unquote. He compares the soul to a musical performance in which, quote, the non-material, higher level conceptual understanding of the piece gets embodied through the performance, unquote. The performance being an instance of mind-body unity. At the heart of his advocacy of the soul is the following. Quote, a perfect spiritual code or, or soul exists at a transcendent level, and it both animates and structures the form of our body, unquote. One can imagine our empiricist colleagues in psychology rolling their eyes on hearing this and objecting that the statement is not an empirical one. How could it be falsified? Aha, comes the reply. The question assumes that this is talking about efficient causality. How is this alleged soul a stimulus for some bodily movement? The statement is about formal causality, of course. What we look for is not a stimulus, but a pattern. Let me put it in other terms. Soul gives us a different way of looking at what appears. Here with Vitz's formulization, we see someone telling a therapist about a life event and soul is brought in with the question, what is the spiritual essence of this action or of this narrative? I do not mean in a Pollyannish high in the sky way because remember our friend Rollo May, the spiritual essence may be a struggle with the individual's daimon for good or ill. Looking through the soul means asking about the musical performance underway in human action experience. In other words, to borrow a phrase from James Hillman, soul is a perspective upon things, not a thing in itself. Soul is not one of the phenomena, not a what at all. Witz told us that the soul, quote, exists at a transcendent level. A transcendent level is an opening upon the all, placing us at the same time in the world and out of the world. Among the things that soul attunes us are these human actions, which Witz and Titus enumerate. Reason and will, human self-consciousness, language, moral agency and responsibility. Soul, moreover, attunes us to our immortal destiny, since soul directs our attention to our life with God, here and hereafter. Above all, soul, as part of our way of looking, draws our attention to the fact that every client, patient, colleague, student, teacher, family member, homeless person living under a bridge is one of the immortals. Bearing that in mind is a gift of the soul. Next slide, please. Paul has been doing the hard work of integration with his colleagues here at Divine Mercy University. And they have published the fruits of that labor in Catholic Christian meta model of the human person. Paul's earlier work, especially psychology as religion, establishes his place, his place in the history of psychology. In particular, his place stands with the following conclusion of this exploration this evening. So I'm going to return to my conclusions. Witz has developed a self psychology in the Jamesian tradition. Witz's self psychology, however, leads us to 
to the soul. The soul is the third thing between psychology and religion, uniting and dividing them. Those experiences that implicate soul and psychology implicated in religion, human rationality, moral choice, will, suffering, love, devotion, deprivation, and sacrifice. Psychology and religion share this common ground, and soul is the lynch, lynch, linchpin between them. Second conclusion, psychology has a religious unconscious. Psychology has never been unintegrated with religion. In going about the work of integration or disentanglement, we need to see how this has been going on unwittingly. Integration needs to be done on a conscious level. Psychology as religion is a good start in that direction. We need to investigate the genealogy of the work of integration. To do so, psychology can turn to the Christian intellectual tradition and find fresh perspectives and psychological topics. Dare to learn from the past. And finally, our third conclusion, there is a truth to self-worship. Psychology can promote self-worship only because the self reflects the handy, handiwork of the creator. The worship of the self is the result of misrecognition. I confuse my ego and the imago dei, the image of God at the center of myself. In desiring self-fulfillment in consumerist terms, I see a wholeness where there is emptiness. I miss, the real, I miss that the real object of my desire cannot be bought. Self-worship is insatiable because its object always escapes. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I'm, 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 I'm very grateful and awed by someone as you know historically sophisticated and so so uh, accomplished, even addressing the topic of what what my work might mean. And so I'm uh, first. I'd just like to thank you very very much, Bob, for for what you said and. Also, uh, the, one of the things that which I'm sure you noticed and were polite enough not to point out, uh, I didn't have a good historical understanding of what I was doing when I was doing some of my early writings. So that connecting it to James, I missed that, I, or I didn't know it, one or the other. And you didn't... You, you mentioned that that's where my approach belongs and that you're quite correct. And I thank you for that, for that education that you've given me there. Well, you know, likewise, Paul, it was, it was a real learning experience spending this, all this time with books. You know, at first I had the first edition. Then it occurred to me at some point, oh, I better get the second one. See what he changed. <laughs> I changed somewhat in the second one. I did. You changed, you changed. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, the second edition is, uh, is uh, um, I mean, they're both very good. I really like the second edition. I was a little more, I, I saw some more positive things in some of my opponents by that time. And uh, so that, and I think psychology now has, uh, is on the right track, frankly, at this conceptual center. Uh, I think with the, the, understanding of redemptive narrative therapy, the understanding of forgiveness and psychotherapy, and the understanding of the importance of the virtues, it's beginning to knock on the door of really understanding the notion of the transcendent self. Mm -hmm. so, and, and of course, I look forward to your masterpiece, which is in press, <laughs> coming out shortly on psychology uh, well, on psychology as a soulless science, soulless discipline, a whole book on it. So that that's, I recommend everybody here, if you really want to know probably what the capstone would be, uh, read uh, read Bob Fogelman's new book. Well, in fact, I just got the um, proofs today. I have to spend the next couple of weeks proofreading. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck on all of that. It's yeah, that's always fun tedious. Part. I know that. One of the things I wanted to mention that is that in my critique of the self psychologist, particularly somebody like Carl Rogers, uh, 
who actually complained that uh, he had a very good marriage actually and but his wife was dying of cancer near the end of her her life and he he complained about whether he, he would not be able to self-actualize because he'd have to spend so much time with her mm. and uh that wasn't i mean it was in print but what what I'm trying the point I'm trying to make is that a lot of American psychology and American culture emphasizes the isolated self, the self without relationships with others. And that's what I was critiquing in, in part when I was cr critiquing the the autonomous self who was just like the you know the the independent American, the self-made man type of notion. Mm -hmm. If you think you're a self-made man, go back and talk to your mother. <laughs> who, go, who took care of you during all of those non-self-made years when you were <laughs> eating diaper changes and food and all the rest of it. But um, but psychology has recovered from that absence of emphasis on the interpersonal. Uh, it was there in the 70s and 60s more, and now they, they do recognize the importance of the interpersonal. So that's part of their recovery, along with the other things that I mentioned, like virtues and, and forgiveness and so forth yeah and i think you're i think i agree with you i think there's a lot a lot of good going on in psychology these days yes and the only problem now that i have with psychology is a lot of these good things aren't getting out into the popular culture <laughs> uh. <laughs> the popular culture is still lagging and back with the with the consumer self and all of that but uh, sooner or later, the virtues will finally get into the theories of education, and uh, even forgiveness will get into standard uh, psychotherapy training. Yeah, and, and I have noticed in, in re recent years, um, there's, there's much more interest in work of integration of psychology and religion. Yes. I mean, uh, I, I've been impressed with that. I'm, I'm a newcomer to the Catholic Psychotherapy Association. With this journal, but I, I've been impressed with the uh, uh, how many people are involved with it. Yes, all over the country and 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 beyond the, the borders too. As yes. well, it's wow. happening all over, sort of spontaneously, and it's yeah. that's why I think finally its moment is here, and we're going to see something really very remarkable, unexpected, and I think positive emerge from it. And I'm looking for some of that in your book. I'll do what I can. <laughs> some of the positive, remarkable emergences. Yeah. But um, um, so it was. Th I think I I summarized the relationship with um, the consumer psychology by quoting the Burger King thing, theory of personality, which is have it your way. <laughs> Some of us remember when that was an expression used by Burger King to advertise. That's right, that's right. Have it your way, or you're the boss, or you know whatever that type of thing. But um, I think we're slowly getting past that. I think we're getting past. I think there's an emerging development that's really quite quite convincing. Yeah, you know one of the things I'm reading. Um, what you wrote in 1977 about larger society and it's, and it's uh, I forget the exact wording, but it's uh, skepticism with regard to science. What? It's, you, you talked about the, uh, and I can't, I probably can't find it now. But I thought you were uh, way ahead of the curve on that. About skepticism and so about science? Yeah, that there's a growing skepticism towards science and it's developed really rapidly in the last five years, which was way after I wrote those. Right, right. You you saying that in nineteen seventy seven? Yeah, and I was I was I didn't have that much to go on then, but now with the COVID stuff and science is turning out to be sort of like a hired gun. You know, it'll find what you pay it to find. That's especially yeah. true in biological and psychological sciences. You can't do that in physics. <laughs> People don't care too much about the behaviors of different subatomic particles in terms of you know whether it will pay off for them or not. But physics is still, I think, very 
pretty pretty solid. But yeah. uh, but um, although even there, they're beginning to ask, maybe we need a, a, a form of physics that doesn't require experimental support. Mm. Well, that some of them are arguing that we should have a cosmology of of interpretive convincingness, but without necessarily any data. Well, you know, it's it's um, postmodernism has seeped into the everyday culture, hasn't it? Yes. Yes, and that's part of the skepticism about science. Sometimes it's not deserved, but sometimes it is because science has begun to and not in, in, in particularly science in biology and in psychology where there's so many under other variables that aren't controlled whenever you run a single experiment so you don't know whether covid is going to cause you know you know um, people not to be able to have children in the future no one's testing that very much but there are all these other variables they're not testing as long as they get some evidence that one variable does seem to have a positive or a negative effect, but they don't test all the others that are involved. And the same thing in psychology. And it's very hard, therefore, to do good science because there's so many other potentially relevant variables that could be accounting for it. And we're beginning to understand that. And, and they and in, in biology and in psychology, we can't live off the reputation of physics. Right, right. But anyway, that seems to be going on today. But um, who knows? There's a good things and bad things going on. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> At my age, I don't have to worry about that. So other people will have to worry about it. But, uh, <clears throat> well, I'm, 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 um, and encouraged encouraged by the um, increasing acceptance of qualitative research methods in psychology. And yes, I forgot to mention that. You, that's a good point also of, of the improvement in psychology, along with positive psychology and understanding the spiritual is important, understanding interpersonal relations are important, and understanding virtues. Qualitative research. There's another, mm -hmm. this is all part of psychology's becoming older and wiser finally huh <laughs> and and of course some of us had a glimmer of that earlier than others but the field is eventually in i believe incorporating um things that are going to set it up for you know the psychology of uh the soul can I ask you something? Yeah. Um, you talk about in, in the in the in the beginning of the book, you talk about how you, you couldn't teach the self psychologist anymore. And this is back in the late 60s, I take it. Yes. Did you get a lot of pushback from colleagues? No. Um most of my colleagues that were, were there were experimental psychologists or physiological psychologists or cognitive psychologists. And they considered this sort of enthusiasm for Ro Rogerian self psychology that they were slightly embarrassed by it mm -hmm. because it wasn't really scientific mm -hmm. and they didn't want to say anything about it. So when I said I couldn't find it being valid, I didn't get much pushback. One reason at, at, that I was at NYU, thanks to Providence, NYU, New York University, the faculty is all over the place there. It's not a collegial place. Uh, it, you know, it, and, and not being collegial, there wasn't much interpersonal pressure because you didn't know each other outside of just the, the, the university setting. Some of them people lived in Massachusetts, others Long Island, some in New Jersey, a few lived downtown there near the university, which is where I live. So, but your personal lives were all separated. And because of that, they didn't bother me that much. They oh, required me to publish. They didn't like what I was publishing. But uh, as long as I kept active, they kept, you know, my my raises weren't high, but they would support me. Here, here I thought all the faculty, psychology faculty were meeting in Washington Square Park and having coffee every day. 
<laughs> and, and then throwing bricks at me or something. No, <laughs> they didn't do that. They were uh, they weren't friendly about it, but they were not uh, in, in any significant way hostile. Mm, that's good. Yes. So uh, that I don't want to pretend that I was some sort of outcast who suffered through, through years of rejection. No, it was the loneliness and the isolation, but not the criticism. The loneliness and isolation was somewhat difficult, but I didn't have that much isolation because we had six kids oh. <laughs> in a small apartment on the 23rd. Oh on the 23rd floor. Oh my, in Manhattan? In Manhattan, down to in the village. Oh gosh. Yeah, we're in Greenwich Village on Bleecker Street. Oh my. And my wife was terrific. She was terrific. She was also a professor there. Mm. In French, in the French department, French literature. Well, I probably walked by your apartment because I went to school and, and I went to Manhattan College. Oh. And going to the village was always a big deal, you know. <laughs> well, that's where I, I lived in the village for 47 years. But anyway, I'm optimistic about where psychology can move to and can develop. And I hope other people can see ways to move it that way. Um, exactly how I don't know, but I think the soul is a, as, as your book is focused on would be a great place for many people to start because that's the, the supernatural component that has to be admitted into psychology. And once you do it, you also admit you're no longer in the empirical, in the business of empirical testing. Mm -hmm. But the idea that everything has to be empirically tested is just an assumption. An assumption that is now often even controversial other places. So um, if you can be reasonable and rational and sensible and makes intelligent sense out of it, uh, that's important. And that's what's, for example, there's an institute in Rome um, called the Expanded Reason Institute. And that institute was set up by uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, now then Pope Benedict the, the 16th. And what he really wants to do is to bring reason back to its significant contribution to the, to the intellectual life and not have it just reduced to empirical uh, reductionistic science. And so that, I think that's really important. And uh, and I see other signs of the notion that we're going to expand and the notion of integration. As long as we don't see integration in psychology as the form of salvation. <laughs> right. right. It's not our integration can be an intellectual, very rich thing, but our salvation comes. In, you, you don't have to be smart to go to heaven. <laughs> I think the smarter you are, the maybe you, you have a liability, sort of like being rich. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I, one of the things, from my perspective, of course, one of the things I, I hope to see is that, is that as psychology begins to reconsider the soul again, it'll, it'll look to its own past and draw out some of the riches that have been forgotten. In the yes. Past. 150 years. Look, that's one of the things about that. That's one of the things I want to underline. And, and again, is your book and your essay here. I, I don't know about the book yet on the soul, but your essay here so, so put this set of questions in the history of psychology and of the intellectual life. That's a major contribution. But, you know, that is, you know, that's a big idea that can suddenly enrich the environment of what people are going to be reading and thinking about. And, and it'll become commonplace. That is, people will say, well, you know, we, we can cite uh, the best part of, say, uh, of Augustine, St. Augustine, or we can, by the way, the first theorist of the unconscious 
was St. Paul when he said, why is it that we do what we don't want to do and, and don't do what we want to? <laughs> he was on the defense mechanisms and things like that implicitly he sure was. <laughs> right there. And it took how many more years before? Anyway, uh, but your book, by putting it in the context of the history of psychology itself, uh, especially because of, and I have the personal fondness for William James, but, but, but for all of them that you brought in, one was Pace, wasn't it? Yes. I didn't know of him at all. I, what, what excuse for education do I have if I didn't know about Pace at all? Pace is a really interesting fellow. <clears throat> he was one of the first members of the American Psychological Association. Really? He wasn't a charter member, but I think he got elected into the APA the second year. Wow. And um, yeah, he did. He's, he's from Florida. He's an American. Uh, and he studied with Wundt. He was um, in Paris studying physiology. And then he was in a bookstore and he came across a book by Wundt. He said, oh, I want to study with this guy. And he, and he went to get, <laughs> he went over to Germany to do that, huh? Yeah, he he, he yeah he, he got permission from his order to do that. Or he was, a, I think he may have been a diocesan priest. But anyway, he was at Catholic U. He did some experimentation. So he had it, he, he earned his uh, street cred that way. He also became uh, editor of the Catholic Encyclopedia. And he was, I think he was founding editor of the New Scholasticism and the American Catholic Philosophical Association. Wow. He, he's a really, he never wrote kind of like his magnum opus on psychology. But there's a lot of good stuff available. By well, thank you. Thank you for letting me know about him and doing all the rest of that historical work, because that's uh, a real contribution for other people now is you've laid out different lines of reading, investigation, finding earlier ways of saying things that today might suddenly seem very innovative. Right. So, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. First one is a uh, do you think that Martin Seligman's positive psychology has further opened the door to the discussion of the role of religion in emphasizing, in emphasizing meaning in his PERMA qualities, not as a full discussion of the inner life, but as acknowledgement of its importance? I wonder what you and Dr. Paul Vitz think of Seligman in this context of integration. Well, I, I would cite him as somebody who has opened the door that way. He's explicitly said that it's not for psychology to talk about which virtues are more worthwhile or what the goal of them is and so forth. He said that's up to philosophers and theologians. So he's actually opened the door explicitly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think he's done a, made an important contribution. You can talk about virtue and character and psychology again. Yes. And he's tried to he's tried to do it in a way that uh, is, is scientific. Yes, unlike some of yeah. the early humanistic psychologists who kind of rejected scientific approach altogether. Right. No, so I think I think Seligman is, is important. Let me see. Go to the next. Let me the next question here. I wonder how you view Viktor Frankl's work in logotherapy in this context. He was talking of the will to meaning as the secularist promoted self theory. I was thinking of the Rogerian context of self psychology, which Frankl critiqued in his book, The Unheard Cry for Meaning. Frankl and Rogers were almost contemporaries. They, they were more than almost contemporaries. They were contemporaries. Yes, they were contemporaries, yes. Yeah. Um, and in fact, Frankl came to the U.S. on a number of occasions. I don't know if, if, he, if, he, if he knew how personally he knew Carl Rogers, but very likely. Um, yeah, Frankl is really important. Yes. Especially, he, he, there's more depth in his work. And because of his, his own experiences of suffering, he saw a positive role for 
suffering in one's life. Not that it, it's, it's always um, a good thing, but it, it's one can still find some meaning even in suffering. I mean, to, to me, that's been important. When you, when you can't work, when you're isolated from all your loved ones, as he was in the, in the concentration camps, there's still a possibility of coming to find some meaning or significance in your life. Yes. Um... Uh, he, uh, when he was in this country, uh, he said one thing that the U.S. needs is probably they should put up a statue in the San Francisco Harbor, a statue to responsibility, as a, as the as the, if you will, as the, uh, uh, as the complement of the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> statue of responsibility. <laughs> As he learned here, we meant by freedom, freedom from anything, not, uh, freedom, not freedom for anything. Right, right, right. But he was a very, he's a precursor of a lot of the things that uh, have been discussed tonight by both, uh, by both Dr. Kugelman and myself. Yeah, he really, he really has a place in this story. Yes. Yeah. Um, Say oh yeah, even before World War II, he was involved in um, suicide prevention. Who was? A young as a young psychiatrist. Frankel. Yes. Wow, okay. Uh, I don't, I, I think he was working with adolescents, if I'm not mistaken. I didn't know that. Yeah, he he was he, he was another product of Vienna. Vienna had many important psychologists in the twentieth century. And he's one of them. Yeah, the three great ones were Freud, Adler, and Frankel. Right, right. Let's see, let's see what the next question is here. Um, in your lecture, you said something like formal cause is the tricky one. Can you please say more about this description? Yeah, I've gotten really interested in formal causality. Um, of you know, Aristotle talked about four causes: efficient, formal, material, and final. Mostly, science in the natural sciences, they're interested in questions of efficient causality, cause and effect relationships, as it were. But um, uh, formal causality has to do with essence. And um, it's, I, I was really taken by the, what the, the McLuhan's proposed. And if you want to find the, the formal cause of a, of, a, of, a, of a book or an article or something, or, of a, or of an advertisement even, you look to its audience. So it's, it got me thinking about when, when one is writing or doing anything along those lines, one has either clearly or vaguely some idea of who is this, this writing is addressed to, or whom are you doing it? Because it's not happening, it, it may be happening in isolation, but it's still, it, it's happening with um, somebody or some people in mind. And so in that, and that, and if you have that, um, reader that you're addressing, and that is the context in which you produce the work. So the work is ultimately what the reader then gets. And so that the, um, the effect in some respect comes before the cause and formal causality. For example, in politics, the formal cause of, an, of a politician's words can often be the desire to get the votes of the audience. Oh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it, it, it's, 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 difficult. it's tricky in that way. But I think in, if we're gonna be talking about the soul and psychology, work needs to be done on formal causality. Final causality too. So what's the goal, the purpose, the end in mind? 
But um, uh, formal causality is important because um, we tend to think of the soul as a stimulus. We tend to think of it, if, if, if we think of it at all, think of it as a stimulus, and then it doesn't make any sense. But to think of it in terms of, of form, uh, which is how many people over the centuries have thought of it, I think is, is really important. That makes sense? Let me see, I don't know if any, if any of the... Your answer was fine by me. Okay. And by politicians. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Let's see. Oh, here's a, here's one. Here's a new uh, one. You spoke about psychology trying to study things Christians attribute to the soul. Do you think in the future we will find things that cannot be attributed to a biological thing? If so, how will it affect psychology? Well, uh, if you're Thomistic, there's always there's always an element of the body that's involved. However. We are we're not confined to the biological level. Um, for 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 uh, Aquinas, it's it's the case that when we are thinking rationally, we are doing something that transcends the, the body altogether, because what you what thinking deals with concepts which are not material. So, yes, we will be think, we'll, we will be finding things that cannot be attributed to a biological thing, because we're not simply um, biological beings. We're also cultural, spiritual, social beings, if you will. And all of those have to be taken into consideration. Yes, and one way of thinking about it is that our is that the human mind transcends the mind of, say, animals. Yes. And that that transcendence means that we're qualitatively capable of mental operations that are distinctly different from animals. And second, that those qualitative, that, that our consciousness is not necessarily at all physical per se. And if you want to think about it even further, because we've experienced transcendence from the animal world, we see animals as having a lower level and we, we're, we've transcended them and we're unique. And that, that and if you think of that as a non-physical consciousness, as the transcendent consciousness is, transcend, is spiritual, we can also imagine another transcendence which is higher than our own. And we get hints of that in the lives of mystics and people with near-death experiences. Mm -hmm. And the thing that comes out of that is they say they cannot even speak about what it was that they experienced. It's as though they've so transcended our, our own understanding, which is already transcendent. They've gone to another level of transcendence, which cannot even be expressed in our, at our level. Right. So these are non-physical both the spiritual transcendence of the mystic and the normal human consciousness, which seems to be unique to all humans. And uh, it's non-physical. This is what, you know, uh, Pace saying that Thomas needs to get involved in experimental psychology, otherwise the materials would run amok with it. Um, we have the same situation today with physicalism being default metaphysics, if you will, of much of psychology. Yes. So you, in, in that way, you, you lose anything transcendent. Yes. Material. Yes, yes. So yeah, that, that, that's, an, that's an important part of this. Um, would our brain still show spiritual experiences? Psychology scientists at the Yale University have unearthed the exact spot in the human brain which activates when people experience spirituality. Um, you know, one of the things I found out in when I was working on the book on the soul was that one of the substitutes for the soul, maybe the most important one, is the brain. Because 
people will, will say things like, my brain thought. Well, your brain doesn't think. You think. You use your brain, but it's the person who thinks. And I think that's, that's the important um, counter to a kind of uh, reduction to the, uh, the brain as um, the implicit physical cause of everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, no doubt in spiritual experiences, the brain is active. The brain is active in every kind of experience, scientific, artistic, social, you name it. Um, but that doesn't mean that that's all that it is. Really, yes. if, you, if you want to get a, a, an early, wonderful count of, 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 of this argument that, that um, that this opens up is, is, in, is in William James's The Varieties of Religious Experience, where he talked about how um, just because some people that have religious experiences are psychopathological, they have some kind of disorder, it doesn't mean that religious experience is pathological. All right. Um, it, it may be because some people that have scientific insights are also suffering from psychopathology. But we wouldn't say, well, all that all science is is a result of the brain. So that, that's also the case with, with uh, religious experience. So, yeah, it's important to understand the contributions that the brain makes to our, our psychological life. But it's not the be all and end all. It's not the only thing. Um, I, I've always been encouraged by the work of people like, um, uh, oh, what's his name? Alexander Loria and uh, the, the, uh, the British uh, neurologist uh, who wrote the man who missed, uh, Oliver Sacks. In order to understand- Oliver Sacks, right. Yes. Oliver Sacks. In order to understand the brain, you have to understand what the person is doing. That's yes. all over sex. And there also is evidence that by stimulating the brain, all kinds of things that we um, you, only certain things get uh, uh, stimulated, memories and things of that kind. But you don't have intellectual concepts. You don't have uh, a crisis of uh, mathematics. You don't have uh, many of the higher level things that we that are purely mental. Do not right. be capable of being stored in the brain or elicited by stimulation of the brain. Right, um, right. But this is the basic issue. Over and over again, when we argue for the soul, we'll be arguing that the brain, although it may be involved in some modest or significant way, is not the whole story, that there is more. That we expand reason beyond the material. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, here's the comment I want to get to. I think Christian psychology has been going on longer than you said. It went to John Cashin and his mentor, Evagrius. What do you think? Oh, yeah, Cashin is great. Now, Cashin was a contemporary of Augustine. Uh, but I, I think Cashin's introspection, his, his analysis of the, uh, the eight flaws, uh, which included uh, Sadia, is, is first rate stuff. And Evagrius is good as well. All, all of those, there were, there's the, the desert fathers and mothers um, have an important place in the history of, of the psychology that we're trying to do. I also would recommend 12th century Cistercians, Bernard of Clairvaux, yes. for example, on, on pride and humility, Alrud of Raveau, on spiritual friendship. Uh, they, they had a wonderful understanding of, of love. Their, their analysis of love is just, just really important. So that's, that's another high, highlight, high spot in the, in the history of, uh, of, of a Christian psychology. Well, I came across something that's also relevant. Many of you know that cognitive behavioral psychology was sort of seen as a form of, was interpreted as a form of stoicism. 
you know, modern form of it. But yeah. it turned out some, uh, a young man searching for his name now, can't quite come up with it, did a dissertation on what the Stoics actually, what, what they actually taught. And the, all this, most of the popular Stoics had a theology mm. that was part of it. And that's during the time of, you know, the third, fourth, you know, the probably from around two centuries BC to three or four centuries uh, after the birth of Christ. So the Stoics had a theology involved in their um, uh, psychology. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Stoic Stoicism is a really interesting um, form of ancient thought because it was explicitly therapeutic. Yes. And so a, a lot of a lot, I think a lot of um, good recurrent psychology owes a lot to the Stoics. And they did have a they did have a they did affect they did have a uh, uh, an impact on uh, Cassian's thought. For example, yeah. Okay, let's see. Are there any other questions here? Could you offer what you think is the best intro book to self psychology? Um, hmm, good question. Um, it depends on which self psychology you want to study. I, I, I would start with Vitz's book, Psychology is Religion, for example. One. That would be a great book to start with. Sure, go out and buy it. Yeah, get the second edition. Get the second edition, and I'll make 45 cents on that. <laughs> um, I also think that you could, uh, anything by Rollo May, I think of, of, of those selfists from the mid-20th -century, mid century, Rollo May is really um, important. There's a, new bio, there's a new biography of Rollo May, just came out last year, which is, which is a wonderful look into his life and work. He's a very complex character. Um, but, um, and then if you really wanna go to get to the good stuff, read the two essays that he wrote in the, in the, uh, the book, Existence, yeah, in 1958. Which was an introduction of experiment of excuse me existential psychology to to North Americans, and uh, May's contributions are the clearest. You really had a gift for uh, uh, speak writing in a way that people could understand. And uh, so, and, but that that book also contains other people that are important. So of, of the of the self psychologists, I think the existential psychologists are the most important. Right. Maybe maybe a book by Frankel. Then I don't know. Frankel, Man's Search for Meaning, of course. Yeah. Is is really good. And, and I and I also uh, strongly recommend oh, anything by Adrian von Kahn, uh, especially um, the Art of Existential Counseling, which I, th I think is, is is an important contribution. Um, so anyway, so those, Paul, did you have any other you wanted to recommend? I, no, I, uh, well, uh, maybe something by Viktor Frankl. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's the existential self notion. Um, but I, I, you might even want to read some critiques of, of Carl Rogers and people like that who were more yes. extreme and, and, and I think were uh, somewhat simple minded about what they thought of as the self. Yeah. Uh, it, 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 but that's all I have to say on on where you'd get your introduction. Yeah, you read my book. That's right. <laughs> the second <laughs> edition. <laughs> Let's see. I was wondering, in a practical way, how practitioners can apply this work, rejection of selfism, with clients to help them understand themselves. What might this look like with non-Christian clients who don't hold the same values, same view of values and virtue? Um, and I, um, I'm not, I'm not a therapist, so I don't have uh, a 
a fund of uh, great insights to offer you there. But you know, the the with as I understand it, you always start with where people are, and and let the, uh, let them show you the way that they need to go. So that that's my my comment on that one. Um, I guess I would say that um, always let them know that from your perspective, all all people have great worth. You don't need to tell them it's because they're made in the image of God, but that everyone's self in that sense is uh, a part of the image of God. The problem is they have to find what I call better than self-worship, more a form of truthful self-acceptance, which means love or, you know, most <laughs> Christianity assumes self-love, you know, love your neighbor as yourself, or uh, we, we look after ourself. In the scriptures, they'll talk about how a husband should look after his wife as though he's part of himself. Uh, they mean the same thing of, in terms of self-love as a natural phenomenon that we should always uh, then apply to others and then to God. But so they want to expand love from just on the self to uh, not that that's wrong, but to to put it onto the other and onto God. Mm -hmm. yeah, you don't have to say put it onto God for the non-believing client, but onto right. others. Yes, self gift is a very important idea that's secular that is capable of a secular uh, understanding. Yeah. One of our predecessors in the 20th century was Thomas Werner Moore, who succeeded uh, Pace as in, in the psychology department at Catholic U. And um, he, you know, he, of course, religion was important to him. Moore was a uh, priest. Uh, he founded a Benedictine Abbey in, in Washington, D.C. in the mid-20s. He was, he was a psychologist, and he was also a psychiatrist. He, he had the whole... All, <laughs> um, but you know, he talked about, you know, so, so he said, somebody once asked me, how do you, how do you introduce religion into therapy? And, and his response was, if it's important to the patient, you introduce it, but you don't force it on people. You have to, you have to, um, uh, be true to yourself, but also be, we want to keep them uh, open to where, where they need to go. There's an important example of that taking place now uh, at Harvard uh, University, in, at least at uh, McLean Hospital. There's a Jewish therapist there who just he was a cognitive behavioral therapist, uh, David Ross Marin. And uh, he found that when he introduced the theological issues that were Jewish to his Jewish patients, they got better, faster, and, and uh, in a way better. Uh, when he brought in the whatever their theological understanding was, it was often so important to them that to bring it into the therapy was very important. And, and he has now published several books advocating th this as a way of facilitating uh, uh, mental health in patients in therapy. Mm, very, I did not. I did not. I don't know his work. It's very interesting. Yeah, and and the fact that he was Jewish and the fact that it was at Harvard were both all <laughs> good for it being accepted in a way, if you will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. Well, what was like one final question? Yeah. Uh, uh, it says, uh, atheism is on the rise. Is this because sin is not called sin, but is a psychological condition? Well, sin is, is a theological category. Um, it would be it would be very interesting. I mean, it maybe it's being done, and I just don't know about it. But to uh, look and see how uh, sin would be um, taken up in an, in an inter, in a project integrating psychology and, and uh, religious life. Um, I know Carl Menninger, or was it Menninger had a, what, what, had a book, Whatever Happened to Sin? 
And I think that's that's an important question. Um, one of the well, to, to go refer back to what I what I said in the talk, when May talks about the daimonic, he doesn't call it sin, but uh, it would be easy, I think, to look at what he's saying there and then look at it theologically, because he's talking about the role of sin in human life. But um, for, for him, the, the daimonic is um, neutral, morally speaking. It can be a force for good, but it can also be a force for evil. And, and anyway, that, that's, that, that might be a way to begin dialogue about sin in psychological terms. I have one, two comments. One is... I've shown in a number of, in a lot of different cases that atheists were strongly influenced by bad or negative fathers, mm. or non-existent fathers. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's on the growth now as family disintegration and things like that are more and more common. And right. second, I was an atheist. <laughs> so pray for the atheist. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe people were praying for me that I didn't know, and that's really the biggest cause. But I was an atheist until I was roughly about the age of 40. And so certainly as an experimental psychologist, I was an atheist. And so was my wife. We got married as two atheists in 1969. Wow. So there's always hope, even for us. Well, I'm glad you were here. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm glad you are there. <laughs> <laughs> I think we're about finished with the time here for the I think so. I don't know I don't know how many people have been with us, but whoever you are out there in Zoom land, thank you for your your presence and if you have any questions that I can answer afterwards like um through email emailing or, or whatever, please let me know. I'd be glad to uh, talk with you. And I say the same thing. Uh, thank you for your presence, for your participation. And uh, if you have questions further, then when we've covered an email is welcome. Absolutely. And again, finally, thank you, Paul. For, I, pre I appreciate all you've done. Yeah. Well, thank you. You put in a ma magnificent amount of time, Bob. And so now, as they say, adios. And you know that means... <laughs> To God. To God, that's right. Goodbye used to mean that. God be with you. And goodbye got shortened to goodbye. So God be with you. God be with you. Vaya con Dios. Vaya con Dios.